Our reading this morning is from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 8, and can be found on page 1132 in the Pew Bibles. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Peace and joy. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, as just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though a good man might, some, a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. <coughs> thank you, Dulep, for that lovely reading, and thank you, Helen, for the lovely prayers. So I want to invite Tim up to, to speak to us now. Just pray that um, the Spirit God is with him, that, he, that the words he speaks are your words, Lord, and we can take them in and learn from him, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Well, I wonder, we've talked a lot about peace this morning. What does that word peace actually mean to you? What's the first thing that comes into your mind if I say peace? Is it somewhere peaceful, somewhere tranquil? where you can sit and watch the world go by? Does the word peace bring to mind shaking of hands with those in church? Does it bring to mind peace on earth and an end to wars and injustice? Of course, we know there's lots of different connotations of the word peace. Perhaps at the moment, it's very relevant as we approach the Christmas season. Often as we reach Christmas, our minds turn towards the baby Jesus in the manger and the promise of peace on earth as the Christ child comes as the peace child. It's funny how God works, isn't it? I've known that this fourth Sunday of Advent would be all about peace since probably about October. I've thought a lot about it over the past few weeks, but I've never really had peace about what to say. I've really struggled to see, well, how do we, how do we convey that message of peace? But yet this last week, a lot of things that I've been doing have all, some, for some reason, been about peace. Well, it's not for some reason, is it? It's God. You may have noticed as you came through the doors this morning in the window, two candles that are lit in that window. This candle has been lit with a light that has come all the way from Bethlehem. It's the peace light. Now, I hadn't heard of this until I moved to Luton. There was a conversation with David last Sunday evening that sparked my and Amanda's interest, and we decided to go along. I don't know if you've heard of it before, but it originates in, in Austria, and it signifies light in the darkness. A child from Austria goes to Bethlehem and lights the flame from the eternal flame at the church of the Nativity, where Jesus was born. The flame is flown back to Austria and is distributed across Europe by the scouts and guides and further, further afield as well to America. So we, brought, we went to that peace light service on Tuesday. And as we walked into the church, we weren't just given an order of service and a candle, but we were given a piece of an olive branch. And when we shared the peace with each other, not only did we say, peace be with you and shook hands, but we also exchanged the olive branch with one another. 
So the branch that I started with went to somebody and then it went on to somebody else. And it went all around the church. So these, the olive branch that we got, we, we didn't know who it was from. But it was a symbol of peace between each of us. And it wasn't just Christians there. They were members of other faiths as we shared together peace. So as we began the service, the light that was lit in Bethlehem was brought into the church. And the entire service was dedicated to peace and focused on this peace light. The representatives of different faiths there, as I say. And all I can say to you this morning is it was a very moving occasion. Towards the end of the service, as we did during our Christingle, we all stood around the outside of the church. And our little candles were all lit from this peace light. So we were all carrying that light from Bethlehem. And we sang, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Now, I'll be honest, that's not one of my favorite songs anymore because it's been sung so much. I don't really like it. But I can tell you, as we sung Shine, Jesus, Shine, around in that circle with our candles lit, I was moved to tears because it was a reminder to me that there is hope for peace and it can be achieved. We just have to be intentional about it. We have to be intentional about working for peace, not just in our church, Not just as a church family at peace with each other, but peace in our community, peace in our town, peace in our country, peace in the world. Now that light will stay burning until Christmas and hopefully through to Epiphany when we celebrate the wise men or the Magi coming to see the baby, uh, the child Jesus at the time, sorry. And it it signifies that Jesus is the light of the world. The Jesus whom we're going to welcome in just three days' time when he comes as a baby. We hear it on Christmas night. At our midnight service, we get that wonderful reading from John 1, as we had last week at the carol service. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And it's the same for that peace light. That light that's been lit from Bethlehem, that light will continually shine. So different churches take the light back to different places around Luton. And then it's spread further afield. I know, David, you took a light home, and you've got a light burning in your home. We've got a candle at home to light from that light, to take home. If you want to, if you have a candle or a lamp, come and light it from that peace light and take it to your home to symbolize peace. As we went to Bushmead Court on Thursday, we had a carol service there jointly with Stopsley Baptist. And it was another message of peace that caught me unawares. Steve Moody, the senior pastor of Stopsley Baptist, was speaking about how he spent his time through Advent, not doing a devotion as such, not reading through Luke, shock horror, but he's been looking at the carols that we sing. He's been looking through the Christmas carols. He spent a different day of Advent looking at a different carol. And not just looking at the carol, but actually looking and seeing what do we actually sing? What do we proclaim when we sing those carols? How often do we actually stop and think about what we're singing? Silent night, holy night. It just rolls off the tongue. Well, I know a vicar who once decided he didn't tell anybody but the musicians. In the middle of June, he he sung Christmas carols. Because it made people stop. And it made people think... What are we actually singing? Because when we look at the carols, a lot of them are all about peace. It's about peace on earth. If I can jump ahead to the Christmas story, the shepherds say, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Right there in the Christmas story, the angels announce the birth of Jesus to the shepherds And they bring news of peace. The angels sang that song 2,000 years ago. It's a song that perhaps in our world is overshadowed. And we haven't heard much about peace. If we think of the last century where there's been so many wars, so much bloodshed, it doesn't really feel like there is peace on earth. So it's down to us to start singing that song again. Singing that song of the angels that they've been singing for the last 2,000 years. 
Glory to God in the highest heavens and peace on earth. It's up to us to start singing that song again. So I encourage you, as we approach this Christmas time, listen to that song that the angels are singing. Join in with that song and be singing peace on earth. As we welcome Jesus as a baby on Tuesday night, remember that he comes as the peace child. That as we listen to the story once again, that story we all know so, so well, I think this year we can hear that message that peace on earth is possible. So many other songs that I could look at regarding that message of Christmas being peace on earth. So are we going to take note and listen? Are we going to join in with that song? We've spoken here before about the damage secularism and consumerism has done to Christmas. So it's time for us to take it back for what it is. A celebration that God sent his son son, to dwell among us. Emmanuel, God with us. Peace on earth. But if we think about that song, Peace on Earth, it's been drowned out by our society. But has it been drowned out in our own lives too? I wonder how many of us sat here this morning are perhaps not at peace with a family member. Maybe there's been a falling out that's left us separated. Perhaps neither side wants to make that first move to bring reconciliation. And so we go on avoiding it. What if we've fallen out with a family member and at Christmas time we get a card with their Christmas letter saying that they've been really ill this year, had a heart attack, spent a few weeks in hospital. Perhaps you find out that a family member has been really poorly, yet you knew nothing about it. Perhaps you're sitting here today and you've lost someone close to you. Anne and I have sat with three funeral families over this last week who are facing their first Christmas without a loved one. And I know there are people sat here today who are facing their first Christmas without a loved one. You may be thinking, well, actually, how can I have peace when I'm at turmoil? I'm really struggling. Perhaps you feel very far from peace. Perhaps so far from peace that it hurts. Well, separation from our loved ones really does hurt. And it does cause us turmoil within. But also, there's so many people out in the world who live exactly like that in their relationship with God. They are so far separated from God that it hurts, but they don't know it hurts. And Tom Wright says, as we come back to the passage we had in Romans, he reflects here, at the center of it all, Paul is talking about reconciliation to end all reconciliations. Because at the center of it all, we have peace with God. At the center of the Christian life is the establishment of a loving welcoming personal relationship between individual human beings and the creator God himself. The peace that's being talked about here in this passage is much more than simply being at peace. It's more than our peace of mind. It's more than that our, the conscience, peace of conscience that our sins are forgiven. It's more than the absence of war or conflict. It's the Hebrew sense of peace. It's the shalom the fullness of right relationship with God. Because if we were to read a couple of verses on, reconciliation has been provided by God. That's the peace that this passage is talking about, that peace of right relationship with God. But whilst we know that we're reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, it doesn't stop there. Because we know And we discover that there's so much more than simply enjoying that peace and enjoying that relationship with him. We know that when we are brought into the kingdom, we can then be used for the kingdom to spread that message further afield. We, as Christians, are able to come into the power and presence of God. And when we're in that position, we don't tremble or fear. We're just deeply grateful. 
that we know that the glory of God is lost when we sin or stray from the Lord, which we all do. We know that this world is fallen. We know that this world is corrupt. We know that it can be hard to find peace. But what does Paul say? We can still rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in our sufferings. We don't rejoice our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. So no matter what is happening, we still rejoice that the Lord is the Lord. Because our sufferings, and we know they come, we know there is nowhere in Scripture where it promises us an easy life. We know that when we're doing things for God, when we're stepping out and acting for the kingdom, the enemy will try to unseat us. He will try and attack us from any direction. But we know that if we persevere, the suffering leads to perseverance. So as we rejoice in our sufferings, it leads to perseverance, which leads to character, and that leads to hope. And that message of hope as well, I think, is really important. That we don't lose hope in the world because we know that there is a hope. No matter what we're facing or what we're feeling, we still have the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, that's completely at odds with what the world wants us to think. The world wants us to think that we can achieve anything immediately. It's one where we don't have to build up character because the world doesn't know where it's going. Yet we know where we're going and we can stem the tide of this and we can rest in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the hope that we have in Jesus means that we can celebrate Christmas for what it truly is rather than what the world wants us to think it is. We can begin to appreciate that Jesus came into the world, a dark world, to redeem it from sin and to destroy the darkness. The hope that we have, the hope that we profess, can make us look foolish in the eyes of the world. Because to the world, they cannot see why we have hope. But we know we're waiting for something that the world simply can't see. Yet we can see it because we walk by faith and not by sight. For those of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord, we see more than the world. We see where the Lord is at work. We see where the Lord is present. Just yesterday, a few of us were talking about missing God in the obvious. How often do we look at something in creation and go, oh, that's nice, without really giving thanks that it's a gift of God? A few days ago, as we were driving back, I can't remember where we'd been, Amanda said to me, wow, look at the moon. Did you see it? It was amazing. It was really big and almost orange. It was absolutely glorious. But how many people have seen that and gone, oh, well, isn't that nice? But actually, we need to thank God for those moments when we know he's there. So how much do we miss? Well, we have hope because of the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit that's poured into us. Paul tells us this in the reading we had this morning. Are we in tune with the Holy Spirit to allow the hope that we have not to disappoint as we get toward the very end of the season of Advent, are we running on empty? Do we need to be filled again with the Holy Spirit? Have we spent too much time preparing for the world's view of Christmas and not spent enough time in our hearts preparing for the Savior once again? The latter part of our reading this morning reminds us that Jesus comes. We know that. But he doesn't just come as a baby in the manger, God with us. But he comes to fulfill God's plan for the world. To take on all of our sin and die for each and every one of us on the cross. The love that God shows is not just that he sent his son, but that he sent his son with a purpose to fulfill. He sent his son to die for us. And we can sometimes look past this when we think of the Christmas story. We focus too much on the niceties of a baby in a manger with parents and shepherds. But what if we really stop and think about that scene? 
creator God come as a baby in a dirty stable with a manger for his bed. The world was too busy to see it. There was no room. The shepherds, one of the lowliest in societies, were the first that God said, my son has been born. We sometimes forget that in the midst of the Christmas story, that that baby in the manger will grow up to save us all. The angels sing the song of peace on earth. We too can join in that song. Peace for us, peace with God. We can seek after the shalom that comes with knowing the Lord. So I want to ask you a question this morning. What's stopping you from having peace with the Lord today? When you know the answer to that, I want to ask you, how are you going to find that peace? How are you going to recover that peace? As I mentioned earlier, if it's a family feud, could you make a phone call? Could you send a letter? Could you reach out to someone in need this Christmas time? Ask the Lord to show you what you can do as you search for peace in whatever way that looks for you this morning. When I said about that Christmas letter, somebody who'd been really ill and had a heart attack and a member of their family that I didn't know, I'm ashamed to say that was my brother and that was my niece. So maybe God's asking me to make that brave step of picking up the phone or writing a letter. So I wonder, what's the Lord asking you to do this Christmas time? The song of peace on earth is a song the angels have been singing for 2,000 years. It's a song that we know will get louder over these next few days. So how are we going to respond to that angel's song? How are we going to respond and show peace on earth? And is it too much to ask for peace on earth? I've been challenged this Advent to find the space and time to stop and reflect properly and prepare for Jesus' birth and to look with expectancy for his return. I don't think I've achieved that this year. In church, there's always lots to prepare and get ready for. It's one of our major festivals. It's one of the few times in the year when we get to welcome in so many of our community. But even in the busyness of that preparation, I've noticed God in the small things. It's been such a great joy to be part of this community. On Wednesday, we had people come in. When we'd collected all the food, we blessed it to go to the food bank and food works. And I was amazed by how much food there was on these steps. And I'm sorry, I didn't get a picture for you. If you're on Facebook, there's a picture there. I'll try and show you at some point. But I was amazed just how much the community had got behind that. But even in that moment of going, thank you, it's still tinged with sadness because all that food will be going to people who simply can't afford to put food on their table this Christmas time. It will be going to those people who without that food would go hungry. And it really got me thinking about the state of the world. As I spoke with the residents of Bushmead Court on Thursday, one lady said to me, well, the older you get, the more meaningful Christmas becomes. And I've pondered on that, and I think it is true. As we get older, we realize that Christmas isn't about the music of Slade, Wizard, Wham, or Mariah Carey. It's not the promise of love and the chase for it. Christmas is about love that came down from heaven. Love that's been made real. Real love that appears in Jesus Christ. So we can all follow Jesus Christ. We can all Christian or non-Christian pursue peace on earth. But it's only through our Lord Jesus Christ that we hold on to that hope of what is to come. As Casting Crowns put it, the wrong shall fail, the right prevail. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Do you hear the bells ringing? The life the angels are singing. Open up your heart and hear them. Peace on earth. 
It's a song that will get louder over these next few days. Let's not let it fade out after Christmas time. Let's not let that song of the angels disappear for another year. Let's play it loud enough for the world to hear. Let's make a difference next year. Let's pray for peace on earth and goodwill to all. Amen.